you. <laughs> My name is Kim Hildahl. I'm the director of the TRIO Student Support Services Program here at Carleton College. Educational equity, including college access and success, is deeply personal to me. As a, a low-income first-generation student, I struggled in college because I lacked the skills that I, I needed to be successful. It wasn't that I didn't want to be at college, it's because I didn't know how to be in college. That's why it's my absolute pleasure today to introduce today's convocation speaker, Jim McCorkle, Carleton class of 1990. Mr. McCorkle is the founder and former CEO of College Possible, a national nonprofit organization making college admission and success possible for low-income students through an intensive curriculum of coaching and support. He currently consults with a variety of clients with an emphasis on helping social entrepreneurs create, grow, and scale their efforts. As CEO at College Possible, Jim was responsible for leading strategic organizational development, engaging and building relationships with national partners, and championing, championing, championing the organization's commitment to creating more college graduates. Over his 20-year tenure, the organization grew from a startup in his spare bedroom into a national organization operating in seven American cities, reaching 25,000 low-income students with an annual budget of $30 million. Under Jim's leadership, the organization helped 98% of its students earn admission to college, and he helped raise nearly $150 million. Jim is a graduate of Carleton College and Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. His work has been recognized with many awards, including the Ashoka Fellowship, Alumni Achievement Awards from Carleton and Harvard, and the Executive Leadership Award of Excellence from the National College Attainment Network. He has served on many boards over the years and now serves with Reading Partners Twin Cities. Since leaving College Possible, Jim focuses on sharing his hard-earned wisdom by coaching and developing leaders through his consulting practice, Accelerate Consulting as well as teaching and serving on nonprofit boards. He lives in St. Paul, Minnesota with his wife, Dr. Christine Greenhow, and their son, Jack, and their golden retrievers, Millie and Maddie. Please help me welcoming back to Carleton College, Jim McCorkle. Well, thank you for that very lovely introduction. I appreciate that. It's really great to be back on campus. Uh, it's fantastic to be here in this beautiful building, and I'm here with my wife, uh, Dr. Christine Greenhow. Um, my family has deep connections uh, to Carleton College. I grew up here in Northfield, just down College Street, a few blocks away. It's a little bit weird to go to college in your hometown. I uh, used to joke that when I moved from Burton Hall to uh, Evans Hall, I went from being about three blocks from home to being about eight blocks from home. I had more than doubled my distance from home. Um, many of my family and relatives have worked here. My grandmother, Nellie, uh, way back in the days when Evans Hall had a dining hall. Um, my mom, LaVon, worked for more than 30 years in the library and acquisitions. Just before I was born in 1968, she had uh, suffered a debil debilitating accident to her dominant right hand, and she had more than half a dozen surgeries on that hand. Uh, that was a really painful period in her life, but the silver lining was that she ended up getting hired here at Carleton to work in the library as she recovered. And she absolutely loved it. She often described it as a key turning point in her life, and I think really in our family's life. Before her time at Carleton, she had worked in physically demanding jobs and had really struggled. But when she got here, she really enjoyed her colleagues and especially the opportunity to work with students who had campus jobs in the library. And she loved to read, so the Library was a perfect fit for her. Even though she never got to college herself, she decided to read many of the books that professors had put on reserve in the library. She often commented that it was like getting a college education for free. My dad, George, was a maintenance painter in the shop. 
One of his favorite parts of his job was refurbishing the old woodwork all around this beautiful campus. In fact, he stripped and refinished the wooden doors you walked through this morning to get into this chapel. My parents were proud members of a large team of professionals here at Carleton who helped build, clean, and maintain this amazing place so that students, staff, and professors like you can learn and study together. How about a round of applause for all the amazing people who make this place go? When I was a senior at Northfield High School, my best friend and I took uh, two courses here through a state program that allows you to take classes for free. In fact, he's here right now, Mike Grundhofer of Grundy fame. One of the classes we talk, took was taught by Paul Wellstone, then a political science professor who was later elected in 1990 to the United States Senate. And to put it mildly, Wellstone had a reputation at Carleton for shall we say, uh, passionate views. Back in those days, you registered for classes in person in the registrar's office. And as high school students, we were the last ones to be allowed to register. And as you can imagine, Wellstone's classes were very popular with students. So by the time we were registering, the class was full. Some students overheard the two of us talking about how much we wanted to get into his class, and they told us, just go over to his office and he'll probably get you in. So up we went to third floor, Willis Hall, knocked on Wellstone's door, wearing our Northfield High School letter jackets just so that we would blend in and not be too inconspicuous. And we explained our situation, hoping that he might let us into his class. In typical Wellstone fashion, he was outraged that the registrar wouldn't let us into the class. And I remember him saying, why do they even have programs for high school students if they won't let anybody into any of my classes? So he called the registrar's office and he demanded that they, let, that they enroll us in his class. He got us into that class. I didn't know it then, but getting to know Paul, as he preferred to be called, would change the course of my life. More than anyone, Paul was my hero and my inspiration. His passion for economic and social justice was contagious. When I became a student at Carleton, I took virtually every class that he offered. But I remember one moment in particular. We were in a small seminar studying the great social justice movements. Many of us were lamenting the state of affairs in American politics and bemoaning the forces of the status quo. We are complaining about how ordinary people can't really make a difference in a political system that seems rigged in favor of the rich and the powerful. And then Paul said something that stopped us all in our tracks. He said, if the people in this room can't change the world, then who can? In that moment, I began to appreciate my own power and potential. That was the first moment that I heard the call of service to others. And I began to ask what I could do to make this world, this broken world, a better, fairer, more just place. I went on to volunteer on Wellstone's 1990 Senate campaign after I graduated from Carleton. And I worked full time on his successful 1996 campaign. Seeing him become a United States Senator only reinforced for me his central lesson that each of us can and should find a meaningful way to contribute to making the world a better place. It took me quite a while to find my life's work. Paul had planted a seed when I was here at Carleton, but it took years of reflection, study, and trial and error to find my pathway. I still remember the moment the idea for College Possible, my organization, first popped into my head. I was a graduate student at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I was in a seminar about affordable housing, and I guess somehow my mind wandered a little bit, and then all of a sudden it came to me. I should create a nonprofit organization that would help low-income students get to college and graduate. At that moment, it felt like an epiphany. 
a moment of peace. I've been trying for years to find my way, and now suddenly I knew my calling. But over time, I realized this was not so much of an epiphany, but a calling born out of the sum total of my life's experiences. My own parents had met as teenagers, and they fell in love, but then they dropped out of high school when my mom got pregnant. They eventually earned their GEDs, but their greatest dream was that their five children would go to college. And I'm very proud to say that we all did. I remember when my oldest brother, George, was a senior in high school. I was just a little boy then, and he had a really good job the next town over in Faribault at a canning factory called Crown, Cork, and Seal. It must have been very tempting for him to take that full-time job and start his life. No one in my extended family had gone to college at that time, and at least in my family, going to college seemed like a little bit of a risky choice. But my parents desperately wanted him to go to college. To this day, I'm incredibly grateful that he made the courageous decision to go to college. He paved the path that my siblings and I would follow in the years ahead. I can still remember when we took him to college as a first year student. It was a really big deal in our family. So we piled all seven of us into a couple of cars, including my parents' old Ford Green Station wagon, and we drove to Winona State University in southeastern Minnesota. When we got there, I could see on my, face, my parents' faces their intense pride that their oldest son would be a college student. I know now that their pride stemmed from their deeply held belief that the entire trajectory of his life would be changed forever. I also remember, as a very little boy, being blown away at how cool college seemed. The thing that amazed me most was that in the dining hall, they had a soft serve ice cream machine. And it was all you could eat. For longer than I care to acknowledge, that is the primary reason why I wanted to go to college. As the youngest of five kids, I had an amazing vantage point on the world. On the one hand, I could see the challenges my parents faced making ends meet without much of an education. On the other hand, I saw all of my siblings go to college and beyond. For example, my sister is a medical doctor and another brother is a civil engineer. They each gained a good career and a pathway into the middle class. Their lives just looked and seemed to me to be so much easier and more comfortable than my parents' lives. After I graduated from Harvard, I returned home to the Twin Cities to found a nonprofit organization called College Possible. Our focus is on helping low-income, first-generation young people get to, get to college and graduate. The vast majority of our students come from communities of color, and I'm very proud to say that our model is effective. Fully 98% of the students we've worked with have earned admission to college. Our key innovation was harnessing the spirit of service in America's young people. We recruit recent college, graduate, or, or recent college graduates to serve as AmeriCorps members. You might think of AmeriCorps as sort of a domestic Peace Corps. These idealistic recent college graduates serve as coaches to our students, guiding them through the process of a preparing for college, preparing for the SAT, ACT, applying to college, and then helping them navigate the obstacles they might face when they're in college. Those early days at College Possible were difficult. I was working out of a spare bedroom in our apartment. But eventually we raised enough uh, funds to open an office and hire our first few staff members. We started with a pilot program with just 35 students. But bit by bit, the program grew and developed. And over time, we expanded to eight American cities. Twin, the, first the Twin Cities and then Milwaukee, Omaha, Portland, Oregon, Philadelphia, Chicago, Seattle, and Austin, Texas. When I stepped down as CEO of College Possible in the summer of 2020, we were reaching about 25,000 students 
with an annual budget of nearly $30 million and a team of about 400 staff members. That experience was the greatest joy of my professional life. I still can't believe that my job was helping young people fulfill their full potential. When I first started working at College Possible, I thought I'd help young people in a situation like I once was. But what I found was that most of our students have had so many more challenges than I ever did. My parents were white, they were married to each other, they owned a home, and they desperately wanted us to go to college. So many young people in America don't have all of those advantages. In our first group of 35 students during our pilot program, there was a young Somali immigrant named Kalani Abdullali who joined our program. Her family had immigrated here with virtually nothing. Her for family had left a war-torn country, coming to our country to seek better opportunities like so many others who have immigrated here. Kalani attended Carleton College and graduated in 2007, went on to earn a law degree at the University of Minnesota. And in 2009, her brother Urko graduated from Carleton College. I think many people think of Kalani and her siblings' stories as somewhat typical. Many assume that each generation in America will just do a little bit better than the one before. But most people are shocked to learn how few people from low-income backgrounds actually earn college degrees in America. Upper-income students are five times more likely to earn a college degree than their low-income peers. Five times. How can that be? In the richest nation on earth, how can that be? My friends, surely we are a better nation than that. We are better people than that, aren't we? We can and must do better. I was drawn to this work primarily for moral reasons. I do not believe it is fair or just to have such enormous and persistent gaps in who gets the opportunity to go to college. I believe that everyone, regardless of race, class, gender, or background, deserves a fair shot to go as far as their talents and efforts will take them. I believe that's the unfulfilled promise of America. But the challenge of who earns a college degree in America is not just about unfairness. This is not just a moral pro problem. It is also a fundamental economic problem. Our nation needs a well-educated well population to compete in an increasingly globally competitive economy. We currently have the greatest wealth disparity since any time before, since any time before the Great Depression. A key part of the pathway out of this disparity is to ensure that everyone gets a fair shot at a decent education. We now live in a country where almost all of the job growth and wage growth goes to people who have some form of post-secondary education. College graduates will earn a million dollars more over the course of their lifetime. They live longer, healthier lives, and their own children are much more likely to go to college. So there's no doubt that this is both a significant moral and economic problem. But what drives the disparity between who earns a college degree and who doesn't? Well, that's an incredibly complicated question. It's probably not one I can do justice to here today. I'm planning to save plenty of time in the question and answer session, so hopefully we can explore some more of those questions. But some of the key drivers of this disparity are that students from low-income families often don't have parents or family members who have ever successfully navigated the complex process of applying to college. In addition, they too often don't have the kinds of supports they need to navigate the obstacles they might face when they're in college. Far too many students in America come from a public school system that fails to provide them with a college preparatory education. And of course, the cost of higher education continues to increase at a rate greater than inflation year after year, decade after decade. Many students from low-income families 
look at the cost of a place like Carleton, and assume there's no way they could possibly afford to attend. The price tag sometimes seems to them to be more than their family has made in the last several years combined. My own case is instructive. Two of my siblings went to the University of Minnesota, and two went to Winona State University. While they attended institutions that would appear to be much more affordable, we all ended up with a similar amount of student debt at the end. My attendance here was made possible by very generous institutional aid and other scholarships. But it's difficult for most families, especially families not familiar with college, to understand and appreciate that colleges are often able to offer significant financial aid. That the total cost they will pay may not be the same as they see on the website or in a brochure. There is simply not enough transparency about the net cost of attendance for most people to make good decisions about college. But even if you are able to navigate a confusing and needlessly complex college application and financial aid system, when you get to an institution like Carleton as a low-income person, it can be very disorienting. I remember my first year orientation week getting settled into my dorm room over in 2nd Burton. I felt like I'd entered a different universe. Some of my fellow students had attended selective private prep schools. Some of them had even already lived in dorms away from their parents. And I remember that first week, a student talking about ordering pizzas late one night. And I privately thought to myself, I should slink away right now because I don't have any extra money for pizza. In my family growing up, getting a pizza delivered to our home was a pretty big deal. But then I learned that this particular student had a trust fund, and he could afford to order 10 or 15 pizzas without even thinking about it. It blew me away. It may not sound that painful, but bit by bit, each of those moments can make a low-income student feel like they don't belong, like maybe they're in the wrong place, maybe even that the admissions office made some kind of mistake. It's important for institutions like Carleton to make investments to, to ensure more equitable experiences for all students. It's important to be thoughtful, for example, about holiday breaks. Many students from low-income families have nowhere to go and nothing to eat when dorms and dining halls close for breaks. Maybe they can't afford to return home. And during the summer months when more affluent students are traveling or taking on important summer internships, Students from low-income families are often working to save money for college, or maybe even to send money back home to help support their own families. I am very pleased that Carleton College is working to address these kinds of less noticeable issues of equity. People often ask me what our country should do about all of these issues. I think at the highest level, it's important to recognize that among all people who start a four-year college degree, degree program, less than 60% ultimately earn a college degree. I'll say that again, a lot of numbers. Among all people who start a four-year degree program, only about 60% or a little less will actually earn their degree within six years. The graduation rates for low-income families are shockingly low. The vast majority of low-income students go to public two- and four-year institutions. In my view, the most important thing our country can do is to invest in efforts to ensure that more of these students actually graduate. It is a terrible shame that so many young people have managed to earn admission to college and, never, and then never earn a degree. That's really the worst of all worlds. Without a degree, you've gained almost no new earning potential. You most likely now have student loan debt. And perhaps most heartbreaking, such students often leave with a broken spirit. They return home to their friends who say, I told you so. College is not for people like us. College is just a waste of money 
that will leave you stuck in debt. These kinds of stories reverberate in low-income communities and communities of color in ways that significantly diminish the very aspiration of college. Our public colleges need to do much better when it comes to helping support these students in ultimately earning a degree. At selective institutions like Carleton, on the other hand, the problem isn't really about graduation rates. Places like this often have graduation rates close to 100%. The challenge for America's highly selective institutions is that they simply don't enroll enough students from low-income backgrounds. In my opinion, selective institutions need to redouble their efforts to reach out in the admissions, and admissions process to identify promising low-income students and students from communities of color. And then they need to ensure that they assess those applications in an equitable way. I am especially pleased by a new initiative here at Carleton to address this very issue. Carleton trustee emeritus Jack Schuler and his family have committed $50 million to support this kind of work. Carleton must match that gift with additional donations and then use it for financial aid to add incremental new low-income and, and undocumented students. And this gift is structured in such a way that a portion of the money will be invested in the endowment so that this program can operate in perpetuity. Mr. Schuler and his family have made similar gifts to other colleges, and they plan to do even more in the future. I would love to see many more selective institutions invest their resources in this way. One of the issues that's been raised a lot in recent years is the basic question of, is college really still worth it? Many people look at the rising cost of college and the ever-growing debt burden and wonder if it's all really worth it. While it's true that college is very expensive and the costs continue to grow at a rate greater than inflation, by almost any measure, it still seems like the single best pathway out of poverty for most low-income students. The headlines often focus on people who have $200,000 of student loan debt and are stuck as a barista in a Starbucks. But these cases are rare and they're extreme. A good rule of thumb is to only borrow as much for a four-year college degree as you're likely to earn annually once you graduate. And if you do this, generally speaking, you will be able to pay off your student loan debts without an undue financial burden. And so it's instructive to note that the average student loan debt in America is between thirty-five dollars and $40,000. So even though there are valid concerns about the cost of higher education, it still strikes me as an extraordinarily good investment. As I mentioned earlier, a college graduate will earn a, a million dollars, some people say more than a million dollars more over their life. And it also opens up a range of career opportunities and overall life satisfaction that is hard to beat with any other pathway. But I've really only touched on a few of the many controversial issues in higher education these days. There are many more. Why does college cost so much? Is the student loan debt burden too high? Should we forgive student loan debt? Maybe college should be free. Will the Supreme Court overturn affirmative action in higher education this summer? Does everyone need to go to college anyway? And my favorite, are colleges really just engines of liberal indoctrination? These are questions that all of us need to ponder. So perhaps in the question and answer session, we can explore some of, some of these questions and certainly others if you'd like. In closing, I want to once again thank you for inviting me here to share my thoughts and reflections with all of you. It is my hope that my story will resonate with some students here. Perhaps someone will hear my story and find their own pathway toward making the world a more just place. There are enormous gaps in who earns a college degree in America, and it's truly outrageous. 
I'm proud that my life's work has been dedicated to helping address this issue. But it's just one of many, many challenges our country and our world face. We can wring our hands, or we could mumble or grumble or complain. But I hope instead that we will hear Paul Wellstone's call even now. If the people in this room can't change the world, who can? Thank you, my friends. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Jim. And as mentioned, we will start with the Q&A in just a moment. However, a little bit of housekeeping. First, this is the last convo for, f for this winter term. But fear not. We're going to start the convocation program again in the spring term on Friday, March 31st, with our winter adventurer, Emily Ford. So that'll be our first one for winter term. Uh, as far as luncheon goes, the luncheon will be at AGH, uh, as usual. We do have a few seats at the table, so if you'd like to attend, please talk to me afterwards. Love to have you. And now, I believe that's it. So let's begin with the Q&A. Who would like to start a question and answer or comment for Mr. McCorkle? Hi. First of all, thank you. Uh, I'm a student of College Possible uh, as well. Um, but during the early years of College Possible, I was wondering how you uh, tried to increase engagement within your program as well as receive funding for it. Thank oh, you. sure. Well, it's great to see you. Uh, and you're a student at Carleton. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's great. I love when, I love those kinds of stories, students that have come through our program and ended up here. Uh, I mean, I'm happy even if they end up at St. Olaf, but uh, uh, especially like if they end up at Carleton. Um, well, when we first started the program, you know, my wife was a big supporter of mine. She's a former high school teacher and a college professor. And so we were kind of building the program a little bit on the fly. Um, and, you know, I had my own experiences to draw on, but as I, as I mentioned in my talk, the first thing I was surprised by was how much, how many more challenges it seemed like the students we were working with had than, than I had ever had or that honestly I was even familiar with. So, you know, we, we began to build the program, and for quite a while we operated out of a spare bedroom, and eventually we opened a, an office on University Avenue above a liquor store. We used to joke about that crappy office, like it didn't really have proper heating or cooling. Like I remember, we asked a little bit about raising money. I remember one of the early fundraising meetings with, with a couple who have now passed away, John and Lucy Hartwell, who were very generous people. And they had come to my office, and the heat just didn't work in the winter very well. It just didn't. I had no control over it. It was really cold. Um, and so I remember partway through the meeting, they both still had their coats on. And I thought, Jesus, this must be really cold in here, right? So uh, finally, John Hartwell says, well, maybe we need to give you a grant to get the heat on in this damn place. <laughs> so. The thing that's funny about that story, though, is that many years later, he had passed away, but Lucy had hosted an event at a fancy golf club, and she was introducing me, and she told that story. I kind of had forgotten a little bit, because like, I wasn't paying attention, really, to how crappy our office was, or whether it was how well heated it was, uh, but, she, <laughs> but she remembered it. And so she told that story to the audience, and then she said, I still, to this day, I don't know if that was a fundraising technique on Jim's part or not, <laughs> but it worked. And uh, I believe they've been, they've been donors ever since. Um, but I, th I think to the part of your question of getting an organization up and running from, from the ground is, it is a big challenge. And I, I kind of look back now that I'm much older and I think, boy, i surprised I tried to do that. It seems kind of crazy. But it didn't really seem crazy then, you know? And one other thing I'll share, since I mentioned my wife, Chris Greenhow, is, you know, as I was coming, as I mentioned, as I come out, I'd had this idea at the Kennedy School of Government. And, you know, as I started to come out of, graduate and started to see a lot of great opportunities in front of me, and I started to think, God, ah, maybe, you know, I should just go make a bunch of money. There were a lot of good offers. And I've always credited my wife, Chris, with saying, you know, like McKinsey and Company, a consulting firm. I was being recruited by them, and, and she said, 
that's not what you want to do. That's not where your heart is. Why don't you give this a try? So I would say, you know, if you're thinking ever about starting an organization, it, it sure helps to have a partner who's encouraging and loving and supportive and, and uh, cause it would have been real easy to say, yeah, why don't you go take a decent job instead of starting a nonprofit that, you know, you might not make any money. Um, so I think having, you know, friends to help support you and the courage. But the last thing I'll say is I think if you're thinking about starting something, I think it really works best if it's something you know well and you feel passionate about. Because one of the hardest things when I first started uh, College Possible was so many people that I would meet with would tell me all the reasons why it wouldn't work. And that's really disheartening <laughs> to have people tell you all the reasons it won't work, why it's redundant to other efforts and things like that. And Paul Thibodeau is here, the former, longtime former Dean of Admissions at Carleton. And he was one of the people that I met with at the beginning to say, hey, what do you think? You, know, you think this idea has any merit? And not only did he you know, help me shape it and think about how to design it, he wrote a letter of support that gave me some credibility as I was trying to get out. And so I think, you know, trying to find other people who have credibility, if you don't yet, to help endorse what you're doing, that's another, another technique. Um, and then finally, I think, I, 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 this is probably my second finally, but anyway, um, the thing about engaging students, I think, is one of the, the really beautiful things about the College Possible model is that we hire recent college graduates and I think that, that proximity and age between, we call them coaches and the students, really helped us be able to engage students in a way that is harder if you're older. You know, if you're 30 or older, a lot of times high school students kind of think, you just don't know what you're talking about. And in some ways you kind of don't. And there's some things you don't know when you're older that you do know when you're younger and you can relate in that way. So hopefully that <laughs> answers some of the question. Yeah, thank you uh, for coming coming to Carleton. Um, I was wondering what you thought the biggest challenge was in creating such a program and like addressing the issues you wanted to address, um, and also maybe something you wish you knew when you first first started out. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I touched on some of those in that in the in the first question, but I would say. It is a hard thing to do. Starting an organization is a pretty hard thing to do. Um, and there were lots of times in the early period, you know, where I didn't know if we were gonna make payroll. So like, uh, kind of one of the, you know, you can talk, you can give a speech about all the big ideas and issues and your moral beliefs in the, in the economic imperative. But, you know, when you're running an organization, you actually have to have money to pay people. And there was times in the early stages where I wondered, are we gonna have enough to pay everybody? Are we gonna make payroll? Um, so, you know, there, there are challenges in raising funds that are really tricky. A lot of the philanthropic world is built to give money to very well-established institutions. Uh, an awful lot of American philanthropy goes to arts organizations and all kinds of worthy causes. I'm not against any of the causes that, 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 that receive charitable contributions. But not very many go, not, not very many of the philanthropic funds really go to helping low-income communities and communities of color. We're starting to see that change over the last, since I started, I think you see more foundations that, are, that emphasize that. But it's still a small portion. So a big, big, a big, big challenge was raising money. But that is something that gets going. Once you get that going and people know who you are, they start giving again and again. And that really is, is a, you know, starts that sort of a flywheel effect where it's not as hard. But we kind of kept doing that over and over again because we didn't just stop here in the Twin Cities. As I mentioned, we expanded and we're in eight cities now. So we had to kind of keep doing that over and over. So I remember flying to Milwaukee and trying to like find out who's gonna want college possible in Milwaukee. And, and I learned a lot about how to position it. So like when I, first went to Milwaukee, it sounded a little bit like this. I would say, we did an analysis uh, and we think you're the most screwed up city in the country and you need our help. And oh, by the way, we're the Twin Cities, you know, kind of the, they kind of already, you know, look askance a little bit at the Twin Cities in Milwaukee. And so then I, as I kind of, you know, learned to hone that message and maybe not quite put it that way, 
to say instead, you know, we have a promising program that we think could be of benefit to people in your community. And then most importantly, what we learned is in expanding to new cities was instead of doing like we did in Milwaukee, where we picked Milwaukee and I went into Milwaukee and I just traveled there and met with anybody who'd take a meeting, and we kind of, I would describe as pushing our way in, it, as I started to read some literature on expanding nonprofits, people were talking about being pulled in. And so there, our third city was Omaha, which uh, we got pulled into because Wally Whites, who many people here probably are familiar with, who's I think the chair of the board of trustees still, um, he had been, to him, a small donor to us, but it hit my radar. Um, and he had said, have you ever thought about coming to Omaha? And unfortunately, I had just said to my board of directors, that we're only gonna to expand to cities that have, that are big enough to support pro sports teams. I, that was sort of a proxy for how big a city we needed. So the first problem I had is I had just told my board, like that would perfectly exclude Omaha. But, but Wally said, why don't you come down? And so I went down to Omaha and he took me around and showed me around. And that made a world of difference, not just because it's Wally Whites and he's a wealthy person, a well-connected person, but most importantly, because he was a local person who said, we want this in our community. And then that was sort of a pulling in. We had a similar person in Portland, Oregon, who did that, and a similar person in Philadelphia who did that, kind of pulled us in. So when you're sitting there doing a fundraising meeting and someone says, well, why do you want to be here? You don't have to say, because uh, we did an analysis or we think you really need us. You know, you can almost play a little bit hard to get, like, I don't really care if we come here or not. You know, I'm here because this local person invited me and thinks we could be beneficial. And it kind of reverses the process. So the process gets a little bit reversed where they're almost trying to entice you to come there as opposed to how I was doing in Milwaukee where I was like pretty pleased with Sugar Hunter, just let us come here. So you know, we learned some of those lessons as we expanded as well. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, you talked about AmeriCorps um, members being a big part of your business model. And I'm curious, um, what would happen if that program wasn't supported? How does that fit into in terms of the expansion or the long-term range of the, the model that you've created? Well, that's a great question. And so as I mentioned, not everybody's familiar with America. I mentioned it very quickly in my talk, but it's sort of like a domestic Peace Corps. So it's usually young people who do a year or two of service. There's different incarnations and increasingly you see um, some older people do it as well. Um, it's a great opportunity for people who have retired who want to contribute something uh, and give back. And so I think there's a huge opportunity as the baby boom generation is retiring. And, but in any event, in our case, it was recent college graduates. So for us, it was kind of two parts to the problem of if AmeriCorps got uh, gutted or eliminated, you know, one was it was some funding, though it wasn't an enormous amount of our funding. I think by the end, our budget was about 30, by the time I left, it's more now, but when I left, it was about 30 million and AmeriCorps might have been three, four, five million, something like that. So it was very significant, but not like, it wasn't like it was half of our revenue, but it was substantial. So you wouldn't want to lose it. But the biggest part was it was our key innovation. It was the key way to get the people power to deliver the program. So if it went away, it would be very hard to just independently for a nonprofit to go try to attract people, recent college graduates, to come and do it without sort of the, the, you know, the official AmeriCorps model. And of course, when you do AmeriCorps at the end, you get an a, a education stipend to help pay off student loans or to use for future student loans. So, we always had a contingency. Um, the gist of it was we would continue to operate and we would try to use the same model, but it would cost a lot more money and it would probably be a lot more challenging to recruit students. Um, the other thing I'll say about AmeriCorps is it's had trouble. Uh, you know, I, I kind of trace it, I don't want to be too political, but I kind of trace it to when Donald Trump came on the scene. Um, something, I think, kind of happened to our country there where there, we kind of turned away a little bit more than we had previously to the idea of young people saying, maybe I want to serve my community or serve my country. Uh, you know, I think more pe many of the people who used to come to us are maybe now more active in politics uh, or in active in public policy. And so 
AmeriCorps organizations across the country are having a tougher time right now recruiting uh, AmeriCorps members. And I think the other part of that, of course, is you know, for quite a bit of that, this period of time, the economy has been very strong and uh, the labor market's been really tight. So it's sometimes pretty hard for a person to say to their parents, hey, I'd like to go to AmeriCorps for $20,000 or $24,000 when you could have taken a job for twice that. So there's that, that challenge. But I will say, you know, I don't know if there's any uh, former AmeriCorps members in this room. Uh, I've never met an AmeriCorps member, I certainly never met one at College Possible who ever said to me they regretted it. That service is transformational to them. And it's tra certainly transformational to the students they get the opportunity to work with. But over and over, the most recurring theme I would hear from AmeriCorps members was that it, they learned more and they got more than they ever gave. Like they thought they were gonna come in and help somebody else, and instead by giving and volunteering and serving others, it deepened their own knowledge base, their own confidence, their experience, and I think made them better citizens and future leaders. Jim, I wanna have you leave the idea of fundraising for a second and head more toward the actual program in identifying the potential of first generation kids. And I've always been fascinated with what, how you as an organization identified the qualities or identified the issues that you needed to address within the program. Yeah. And could you spend a little time sure. just addressing um, I would put it the qualities that you think make possible a first generation kid to you know thrive yeah it's a great question and it's and it's actually quite complex because you know the temptation if you're running a program like college possible is really to get kids that are really good like straight A kids who just need a little something to get into college but you know if you do that you wonder well are we really making a difference you know, where they may be going to get to college anyway. And on the other hand, if you go too far down in the academic profile, looking either at, at their test scores or their grades, you worry maybe you're setting them up for failure. Like maybe by the time they're a junior in high school, they're so far behind that our program, not that, not that anybody is saying we give up on that student, but that our program in two years wouldn't be sufficient to get them into college. So trying to find the middle, kind of academic middle is what we looked for. So like our students had uh, about a 3.0 GPA in high school. So good grades, but not necessarily great grades. When they took a practice at the beginning of the program, when they took a practice SAT or ACT, they were often the lowest 10th percentile, so pretty low. All of them were low income. Over 90% were students of color. And so that was kind of the profile. But we also tried to do a few things that would indicate, help us see that they really wanted to go to college. Because I think one of the challenges is, you know, it, there's some programs that like someone just gets put into. And I think a key part of this is, you know, we really only wanted to help students who wanted to go to college. Uh, so, we made it a little bit hard. We didn't want to make it so we didn't want to replicate the college admissions process and have like kids not get in because they couldn't navigate the system. But we had a process, so they had to do a few things. They had to complete an application. Um, but one other thing I'll say is that one of the things you could also do when you run a program like College Possible is, in each school we'd have say one or two AmeriCorps members, and each AmeriCorps member should have a caseload of around 35 or 40 students. So one way to go into a public high school is to just go find the first 35 kids that seem like a good fit. And then when you say, we got 35 kids, we're done here. And a lot of people at College Possible really wanted me to do it that way, because it'd be a lot easier. I didn't want to do it that way. I didn't think that was fair. I thought the right way to do it was to go in and do a big public information campaign in each of our high schools to try to make sure every single kid in the school would hear about the program and, and know that it's available and get a fair opportunity to apply and be in it. And uh, I think that's really important. It also gives you some, some flexibility. I mean, as you know from the admissions days, if you have more applicants, it gives you some ability to also pay attention to some other characteristics. So for example, there's a lot more female than male that, wanna, that go to college and wanna be in college. 
So it gave us some ability to manage that. Um, and then, oh, and I know you said to avoid the fundraising, but on the fundraising part, the other thing it did, gives you the ability to do is talk about how many, how big our wait list is. Like, how many students would like to have our services if they could? So that's a little bit about how we, how we thought about that. It's kind of the tip of the iceberg, but that's the gist of it. Thank you very much for speaking. It was a fascinating talk. And I just had a brief question. When you uh, go into these cities, do you start like at one school, at one high school, and then branch out to more schools throughout the city trying to like get some presence in all of their school systems? Or how do you sort of manage an inner city expansion? Yeah, well, that's inter it's an interesting question. It's a good one. Um, when we started in the Twin Cities, we started in just one high school in St. Paul and one in Minneapolis. And that was good, you know, I didn't know anything. I was just trying to get it started. And so that was a total of 35 students across both of those high schools. But as we entered other cities, we, we didn't do it that way anymore. We would try to open more high schools than that at a time. Um, in part because we wanted to show, our, part of our key claim when we entered a city is that we are a program that can scale. So like when I got to Milwaukee, for example, they would say, oh, well, the YMCA has such and such a program, and I'd say, well, tell me about that program, and they'd say, well, that program has like 20 kids in it. And so part of our pitch to them was, well, 20 kids in a city the size of Milwaukee, it's great for those 20 kids, but we really need a level of scale. You know, so we would try to really uh, enter with a you know, decent number of schools um, and grow it over time. Um, one of the other things we did with high schools over time, very similar to what I was saying about expanding into cities, is at the beginning, we might go into a school and say basically to a principal, pretty please, would you take us? We'd love to come in, we won't be any hassle, can we just get in here? And what we learned was a better way to do it was almost like an RFP. So we would identify, like say in the Twin Cities, maybe 30 more high schools that we would like to go to that we think have adequate student population could use our services, send them a letter and say, hey, we're gonna expand to say three more schools next year. If you'd like to be one of them, let us know. And so again, it's about reversing kind of the psychology, like rather than asking them if you can come in, you get them asking you if you'd go in. Uh, again, again, it also works for fundraising purposes too, because then we could say, we have a wait list of 27 high schools that would like to have us so it worked in all of those ways. So that's a little bit about how we did that. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. Um, you mentioned this briefly, but I think I was um, curious to hear more about what kind of supports you have in place for setting up students um, to manage maybe a potentially hostile environment for when they actually arrive in college. And so it's not just a self-enforcing system in which you're setting up students when they might not have a good experience in an environment that isn't really made to support them. Yeah, and I did touch on some of that. I gave a pretty gentle <laughs> version of it in my talk, but as you say, it can be actually sometimes quite hostile. Well, the first thing we had to do as an organization was we didn't, when we started, we were, we used to be called Admission Possible before we changed our name. So we used to just be about getting kids, young people into college so the first thing we had to do was decide to support students while they're in college, which, believe it or not, in kind of the field of college access was a big shift. Like for a long time, most organizations, the federal, federally funded programs, state programs, mainly focused on getting students to get to college. They thought it was an issue of access. And as I tried to stress in my talk, uh, you know, for, there's, there's absolute, 100% there's an access challenge. I'm not trying to diminish it. But there are a lot of really great young people who get, to co get admitted to college, get in, and so many of them don't graduate. And as I talked about, I think that is so heartbreaking. So the first thing we had to do was have any kind of presence in, you know, with those students when they're in college. It is a very challenging program question, though, because when we work with students in high school, they're required by a law to come to the building and we can work with them. And our coaches, if, they didn't, if the kids didn't show up, our coaches just go find them. They just go ask the counselor, give me the kid's schedule, and they go hunt them down and say, well, you gotta come to, you got to come to session. And when they go to college, they go all over the whole country. 
So for the most part, when we were doing college programming, it was mostly remote. So it was mostly, you know, working by phone, text, uh, these days more uh, video. So uh, there were serious limitations, I would say, on, on anything that we could do with college students. Um, I, so I think your question's a good one. I think it's one that uh, I've been really gratified to see that students themselves have taken the lead on a lot of this. When I came to Carleton, the last thing I would have ever wanted anyone to know was that like my dad was one of the painters here. That was my deepest, deepest held secret. I didn't want anybody to know that we didn't have very much money. And now you see uh, college students across America wearing I'm First t-shirts and they have formed groups and they uh, gather and support each other in ways that are really powerful. So I think one big sea change has been what at once seemed somewhat taboo or at least minimized, at a minimum minimized, is now something to be celebrated and honored. Um, so I would say honestly at College Possible we probably didn't do too much in the direction of what you're talking about um, other than the fact that we would call attention to the fact that there are students on your campus who came from our program who are going to need support uh, to persist and graduate. I think we have time for one more question, okay. or if you had one of your topics you wanted to address as a closing subject. Nope, okay. One more, ah, here we go. Thank you. You talked about the value of a college education. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you perceive the value of a liberal arts education in your own life? Yeah, well, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, I don't think I knew what a liberal arts education was when I came to Carleton. I don't honestly, shouldn't tell. Well, Paul, you didn't even actually uh, admit me. I think it was your predecessor. I was the first cl last class before you got here. I didn't even know what a liberal arts school was when I got here, so I didn't, didn't like have grand ideas and decide I wanted a liberal arts education. But now, that, well, once I had one, I do think um, that the liberal arts get somewhat maligned. Uh, and, and if you go look at the data, it's actually true that uh, you know, people often like laugh about some of the liberal arts degrees and say you're never gonna get a job. But actually, they, if you go look longitudinally, sometimes they don't do quite as well initially as opposed to somebody who like maybe majored in nursing or business or some very specific occupational thing, accounting. But over the course of their life, their earnings more than catch up and their life satisfaction corresponds. So I do think a liberal arts education is really valuable. One of the big challenges in many low-income communities is, is that if the parents aren't that familiar with college, I kind of tried to touch on this like with my brother George, he had a good job offer in Faribault at a factory and it seemed a little bit crazy that you wouldn't just take that. Like that was a good job. It was a little bit different era, you know, that was a long, long time ago. But with many low-income families, especially the parents, would, they'd really like to see their students major in something that's gonna to lead to a job, and, which is reasonable. It's real. If you don't have much money, you know, and somebody's gonna to go to school and pay money and take on loans, you'd like to make sure they're gonna earn something when they get out. So I think the, the thing that would be great to see would be if there could be a better understanding that the liberal arts do lead to good jobs. You know, like liberal arts graduates get jobs at, uh, at, at just about exactly the same pace as some of the more focused programs. So um, I personally loved it, and I think, you know, going back to kind of the broader themes of like AmeriCorps and service to our country, how we make our world a better place, I think we are a better citizenry, and I think we're a better democracy when people have a broad education and can comprehend things that they don't necessarily work on every day. So even though I'm not a botanist, I took some biology when I was here. And so I have some reasonable understanding about science, which comes in handy when you're thinking about global warming and global climate change. So, um, so anyway, that's just a little bit about that one. Um, well, I think we're about out of time. Um, I wanna just thank everybody for being here. I really appreciate uh, the chance to return to camps. Feels like a little bit of a homecoming and I appreci really appreciate all these good questions here at the end. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Jim, for being here. And thank you all for being here. That concludes convocation for today and for the term.